Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The Haunted Ships, from Traditional Tales of the English and Scottish Peasantry, by Alan Cunningham. First published in 1822, these stories are all based on local legends from the coastal border of England and Scotland. As with many stories in this book, there is a bit of a story within a story here, with different narrators at different time frames. Unfortunately for all of us, this story requires me to imitate a regional accent and to use a number of very old colloquialisms in maritime terms. This story calls for something of a southern Scottish accent, but I'm sure I will deliver it with a pseudo-Irish one. <laughs> I will do my best, and as always, any helpful suggestions in the comments are greatly appreciated. Now, Let's open our imaginations and begin. Though my mind's not hoodwinked with rustic marvels, I do think there are more things in the grove, the air, the flood, yea, and the charneled earth than what wise man, who walks so proud as if his form alone filled the wide temple of the universe, will let a frail mind say, I'd write in the creed of the sagest head alive that fearful forms, holy or reprobate, do page men's heels, that shapes, too horrid for our gaze, stand over the murderer's dust and for revenge glare up even till the stars weep for very pity. Along the Sea of Silway, romantic on the Scottish side, with its woodland, its bays, its cliffs and headlands, and interesting on the English side, with its many beautiful towns with their shadows on the water, rich pastures, safe harbors, and numerous ships, there still linger many traditional stories of a maritime nature, most of them connected with superstitions singularly wild and unusual. To the curious, these tales afford a rich fund of entertainment, from the many diversities of the same story, some dry and barren, and stripped of all the embellishments of poetry, others dressed out in all the riches of a superstitious belief and haunted imagination. In this, they resemble the inland traditions of the peasants, but many of the oral treasures of the Galwegian or the Cumbrian coast have the stamp of the Dane and the Norseman upon them, and claim but a remote or faint affinity with the legitimate legends of Caledonia. Something like a rude, prosaic outline of several of the most noted of the northern ballads, the adventures and depredations of the old ocean kings, still lends life to the evening tale. And, among others, the story of the haunted ships is still popular among the maritime peasantry. One fine harvest evening, I went on board the shallop of Richard Folder of Allen Bay, and, committing ourselves to the waters, we allowed a gentle wind from the east to waft us at its pleasure toward the Scottish coast. We passed the sharp promontory of Siddick, and, skirting the land within a stone cast, glided along the shore till we came within sight of the ruined abbey of Sweetheart. The green mountain of Crefell ascended beside us, and the bleat of the flocks from its summit, together with the winding of the evening horn of the reapers, came softened into something like music over land and sea. We pushed our shallop into a deep and wooded bay, and sat silently looking on the serene beauty of the place. The moon glimmered in her rising through the tall shafts of the pines of Carlaverock, and the sky, with scarce a cloud, showered down on wood and headland and bay the twinkling beams of a thousand stars, rendering every object visible. The tide, too, was coming with that swift and silent swell observable when the wind is gentle. The woody curves along the land were filling with the flood till it touched the green branches of the drooping trees while in the center current the roll and the plunge of a thousand pellets told to the experienced fishermen that salmon were abundant. As we looked, we saw an old man emerging from a path that winded to the shore through a grove of doddered hazel. He carried a have-net on his back, while behind him came a girl bearing a small harpoon with which the fishers are remarkably dexterous in striking their prey. 
the senior seated himself on a large grey stone which overlooked the bay laid aside his bonnet and submitted his bosom and neck to the refreshing sea breeze and taking his harpoon from his attendant sat with the gravity and composure of a spirit of the flood with his ministering nymph behind him we pushed our shallop to the shore and soon stood at their side this is old Mark MacMorrin, the mariner, with his granddaughter Barbara, said Richard Falder, in a whisper that had something of fear in it. He knows every creek and cavern and quicksand in Solway, has seen the spectre hound that haunts the Isle of Man, has heard him bark, and at every bark has seen a ship sink, and he has seen, too, the haunted ships in full sail, and... If all tales be true, he has sailed in them himself. He's an awful parson. Though I perceived in the communication of my friend something of the superstition of the sailor, I could not help thinking that common rumor had made a happy choice in singling out old Mark to maintain her intercourse with the invisible world. His hair, which seems to have refused all intercourse with the comb, hung matted upon his shoulders, a kind of mantle, or rather blanket, pinned with a wooden skewer round his neck, fell mid-leg down, concealing all his nether garments as far as a pair of hose, darned with yarn of all conceivable colours, and a pair of shoes, patched and repaired till nothing of the original structure remained, and clasped on his feet with two massy silver buckles. If the dress of the old man was rude and sordid, that of his granddaughter was gay and even rich. She wore a bodice of fine wool, wrought round the bosom with alternate leaf and lily, and a kirtle of the same fabric, which, almost touching her white and delicate ankle, showed her snowy feet, so fairy light and round that they scarcely seemed to touch the grass where she stood. Her hair, a natural ornament which woman seeks much to improve, was of bright, glossy brown, and encumbered rather than adorned with a snood, set thick with maritime productions, among which the small, clear pearl found in the solway was conspicuous. Nature had not trusted to a handsome shape and a sylph-like air for young Barbara's influence over the heart of man but had bestowed a pair of large, bright blue eyes, swimming in liquid light, so full of love and gentleness and joy that all the sailors from Annan Water to Far St. Bees acknowledged their power and sung songs about the bonny lass of Mark McMorrin. She stood holding a small gaff hook of polished steel in her hand and seemed not dissatisfied with the glances I bestowed on her from time to time, and which I held more than requited by a single glance of those eyes which retained so many capricious hearts in subjection. The tide, though rapidly augmenting, had not yet filled the bay at our feet. The moon now streamed fairly over the tops of Carlaverock pines and showed the expanse of ocean dimpling and swelling on which sloops and shallops came dancing and displaying at every turn their extent of white sail against the beam of the moon. I looked on old Mark the Mariner, who, seated motionless on his grey stone, kept his eye fixed on the increasing waters with a look of seriousness and sorrow, in which I saw little of the calculating spirit of a mere fisherman. Though he looked on the coming tide, his eyes seemed to dwell particularly on the black and decayed hulls of two vessels which, half immersed in the quicksand, still addressed to every heart a tale of shipwreck and desolation. The tide wheeled and foamed around them, and, creeping inch by inch up the side, at last fairly threw its waters over the top, and a long and hollow eddy showed the resistance with which the liquid element received. The moment they were fairly buried in the water, the old man clasped his hands together and said, Blessed be the tide that will break over and bury you forever. Sad to mariners, and sorrowful to maids and mothers, has the time been you have choked up this deep and bonny bay. For evil were you sent, and for evil have you continued. Every season finds from you its song of sorrow and wail, its funeral processions, and its shrouded courses. Woe to the land where the wood grew that made you! 
Cursed be the axe that hewed you in the mountains, the hands that joined you together, the bay that you first swam in, and the wind that wafted you here. Seven times have you put my life in peril. Three fair sons have you swept from my side, and two bonny grand bairns, and now, even now, your waters foam and flash for my destruction, did I venture my infirm limbs in quest of food in your deadly bay. I see by that ripple and that foam, and hear by the sound and singing of your surge, that ye yearn for another victim, but it shall not be me or mine. Even as the old mariner addressed himself to the wrecked ships, a young man appeared at the southern extremity of the bay, holding his half-net in his hand and hastening into the current. Mark rose and shouted and waved him back from a place which, to a person unacquainted with the dangers of the bay, real and superstitious, seemed sufficiently perilous. His granddaughter, too, added her voice to his and waved her white hands, but the more they strove, the faster advanced the peasant, till he stood to his middle in the water, while the tide increased every moment in depth and strength. "'Andrew! Andrew!' cried the young woman, in a voice quavering with emotion. "'Turn! Turn, I tell you! Oh, the ships! The haunted ships!' But the appearance of a fine run of fish had more influence with the peasant than the voice of Bonnie Barbara, and forward he dashed, net in hand. In a moment he was borne off his feet and mingled like foam with the water and hurried toward the fatal eddies which whirled and roared round the sunken ships. But he was a powerful young man and an expert swimmer. He seized on one of the projecting ribs of the nearest hulk, and, clinging to it with the grasp of despair, uttered yell after yell, sustaining himself against the prodigious rush of the current. From a sheiling of turf and straw, within the pitch of a bar from the spot where we stood, came out an old woman, bent with age and leaning on a crutch. "'I heard the voice of that lad, Andrew Lammy. Can the child be drowning that he serves so uncannily?' said the old woman, seating herself on the ground and looking earnestly at the water. Oh, aye, she continued. He's doomed, he's doomed. Heart and hand can never save him. Boats, ropes, and men's strength and wit, all vain. He's doomed, he's doomed. By this time I had thrown myself into the shallop, followed reluctantly by Richard Falder, over whose courage and kindness of heart superstition had great power and with one push from the shore and some exertion in sculling, we came within a quick cast of the unfortunate fisherman. He stayed not to profit by our aid, for, when he perceived us near, he uttered a piercing shriek of joy and bounded toward us through the agitated element to the full length of an oar. I saw him for a second on the surface of the water, but the eddying current sucked him down, and all I ever beheld of him again was his hand held above the flood and clutching in agony at some imaginary aid. I sat gazing in horror on the vacant sea before us, but a breathing time before a human being full of youth and strength and hope was there. His cries were still ringing in my ears and echoing in the woods, and now nothing was seen or heard save the turbulent expanse of water and the sound of its chafing on the shores. We pushed back our shallop and resumed our station on the cliff beside the old mariner and his descendant. Wherefore sought you to peril your own lives fruitlessly, said Mark, in attempting to save the doomed Whoso touches those infernal ships never survives to tell the tale. Woe to the man who is found nigh them at midnight when the tide has subsided, and they arise in their former beauty with forecastle and deck and sail and pennon and shroud. Then is seen the streaming of lights along the water from their cabin windows, and then is heard the sound of mirth and the clamor of tongues and the infernal whoop and halloo and song ringing far and wide. Woe to the man who comes nigh them. To all this my Allen Bay companion listened with a breathless attention. I felt something touched with a superstition to which I partly believed I had seen one victim offered up and I inquired of the old mariner, 
How and when came these haunted ships there? To me they seem but the melancholy relics of some unhappy voyagers, and much more likely to warn people to shun destruction than entice and delude them to it. And so, said the old man with a smile, which had more of sorrow in it than of mirth. And so, young man, these black and shattered hulks seem to the eye of the multitude. But things are not what they seem. That water, a kind and convenient servant to the wants of man, which seems so smooth and so dimpling and so gentle, has swallowed up a human soul even now. And the place where it covers so fair and so level is a faithless quicksand out of which none can escape. Things are otherwise than they seem. Had you lived as long as I have had the sorrow to live, had you seen the storms and braved the perils and endured the distresses which have befallen me, had you sat gazing on the dreary ocean at midnight on a haunted coast, had you seen comrade after comrade, brother after brother, and son after son, swept away by the merciless ocean from your very side? Had you seen the shapes of friends doomed to the wave and the quicksand appearing to you in the dreams and visions of the night, then would your mind have been prepared for crediting the maritime legends of mariners, and the two haunted Danish ships would have had their terrors for you, as they have for all who sojourn on this coast. Of the time and the cause of their destruction, continued the old man, I know nothing certain. They have stood as you have seen them for uncounted time, and while all other ships wrecked on this unhappy coast have gone to pieces and rotted and sunk away in a few years, these two haunted hulks have neither sunk in the quicksand nor has a single spar or board been displaced. Maritime legend says that two ships of Denmark, having had permission for a time to work deeds of darkness and dolor on the deep, were at last condemned to the whirlpool and the sunken rock, and were wrecked in this bony bay as a sign to seamen to be gentle and devout. The night when they were lost was a harvest evening of uncommon mildness and beauty. The sun had newly set the moon came brighter and brighter out, and the reapers lay on their sickles at the root of the standing corn, stood on rock and bank, looking at the increasing magnitude of the waters, for sea and land were visible from St. Bees to Barnhuri. The sails of two vessels were soon seen bent for the Scottish coast, and, with speed outrunning the swiftest ships, they approached the dangerous quicksands and headland of Barren Point. On the deck of the foremost ship, not a living soul was seen or shape, unless something in darkness and form resembling a human shadow could be called a shape, which flitted from extremity to extremity of the ship, with the appearance of trimming the sails and directing the vessel's course. But the decks of its companion were crowded with human shapes. The captain and mate and sailor and cabin boy all seemed there, and from them the sound of mirth and minstrelsy echoed over land and water. The coast which they squirted along was one of extreme danger, and the reapers shouted to warn them to beware of sandbank and rock, but of this friendly counsel no notice was taken except that a large and famished dog, which sat on the prow, answered every shout with a long, loud, and a melancholy howl. The deep sandbank of Karsthorn was expected to arrest the career of these desperate navigators, but they passed, with the celerity of waterfowl, over an obstruction which had wrecked many pretty ships. Old men shook their heads and departed, saying, We have seen the fiend sailing in a bottomless ship. Let us go home and pray. But one young and willful man said, Fiend! Er, where aren't it's nae fiend, but doos Janet Withershins, the witch, holding a carouse with some of her Cumberland comers, and mickle red wine will be spilt atween them. Toad, I would gladly have a toothful. 
I'll warrant it's an any your cowed sour sleigh water like a bottle of Bailey Scrinky's port. But right, drop of my heart's blood stuff that would waken a body out of their last linen. I wonder where the comers will anchor their craft. And I vow, said another rustic, the wine they quaff is none of your visionary drink, such as a drowsy body has dished out to his lips in a dream. Nor is it shadowy and insubstantial like the vessels they sail in, which are made out of a cockle shell or a cast-off slipper or the paring of a seaman's right thumbnail. I once got a hansel out of a witch's quay myself and Mary and Mathers of Dusty Foot, whom they tried to bury in the old kirkyard of Dunsicourt. But the comer raised as fast as they laid her down, and nay would else she lie but the bonny green kirkyard of Keir, among the douce and sponsible folk. So I'll vow that the wine of a witch's cup is as fell liquor as ever did a kindly turn to a poor man's heart, and be they fiends, or be they witches, if they have red wine a steer, I'll risk a drunk at Stark for a glorious toad on it. Silence, ye sinners! said the minister's son of a neighbouring parish, who united in his own person his father's lack of devotion with his mother's love of liquor. Whisht! Speak as if you had the fear of something holy before you. Let the vessels run their own way to destruction. Who can stay the eastern wind and the current of the soul we see? I can find a scripture warrant for that. So let them try their strength on blau holy rocks and their might on the broad quicksand. There's a surf running there would knock the ribs together of a galley built by the imps of the pit and commanded by the prince of darkness. Bonnily and bravely they sail away there, but before the blast blows by they'll be wrecked, and red wine and strong brandy will be rife as dyke water, and will drink the health of Bonnie Bell Blackness out of her left foot slipper. The speech of the young profligate was applauded by several of his companions, and away they flew to the Bay of Bauhuli, from whence they never returned. The two vessels were observed all at once to stop in the bosom of the bay on the spot where their hulls now appear. The mirth and the minstrelsy waxed louder than ever, and the forms of maidens with instruments of music and wine cups in their hands thronged the decks. A boat was lowered, and the same shadowy pilot who conducted the ships made it start toward the shore with the rapidity of lightning, and its head knocked against the bank where the four young men stood who longed for the unblessed drink. They leapt in with a laugh, and with a laugh were they welcomed on the deck, where wine cups were given to each, and... As they raised them to their lips, the vessels melted away beneath their feet, and one loud shriek, mingled with laughter still louder, was heard over land and water for many miles. <laughs> Nothing more was heard or seen till the morning, when the crowd who came to the beach saw with fear and wonder the two haunted ships, such as they now seem, masts and tackle gone nor mark, nor sign by which their name, country, or destination could be known was left remaining. Such is the tradition of the mariners, and its truth has been attested by many families whose sons and whose fathers have been drowned in the haunted bay of Blauhuli. And Trowia, said the old woman, who, attracted from her hut by the drowning cries of the young fisherman, had remained an auditor of the mariner's legend. And trow ye, Mark McMorrin, that the tale of the haunted ships is done? I can say no to that. Mickle have mine ears heard, but more mine eyes have witnessed since I came to dwell in this humble home by the side of the deep sea. I mind the night well. It was on Hallowmas Eve, the nuts were cracked, and the apples were eaten, and spell and charm were tried at my fireside, till... Wearied with diving into the dark waves of futurity, the lads and lasses fairly took to the more visible blessings of kind words and tender clasps and gentle courtships. Soft words in a maiden's ear and a kindlier kiss of her lip were old world matters to me, Mark McMorrin, though I mean not to say that I have been free of the folly of donnering and daffing with a youth in my day and keeping tryst with him in dark and lonely places. However, as I say, these times of enjoyment were past and gone with me. The mare's the pity that pleasure should so fast fly away. 
and as I could nigh make sport, I thought I should not mar any, so out I sauntered into the fresh, cold air, and sat down behind that old oak, and looked abroad on the wide sea. I had my ain sad thoughts, you may think, at the time. It was in that very bay that my blithe good man perished, with seven more in his company, and on that very bank where you see the waves leaping and foaming, I saw seven stately courses streaked, but the dearest was the eighth. It was a woeful sight to me, a widow, with four bonny boys, with naught to support them but these twa hands and God's blessing and a cow's grass. I have never liked to live out of sight of this bay since that time, and morn is the moonlit night I sat looking on these watery mountains and these waste shores. It does my heart good, whatever it may do to my head. So, you see, it was Hallow Mass night, and looking on sea and land sat I, and my heart wandering to other thoughts soon made me forget my youthful company at home. It might be near the how hour of the night the tide was making, and its singing brought strange old world stories with it, and I thought on the dangers that sailors endure, and the fates they meet with, and the fearful forms they see. My own blithe good man had seen the sights that made him grave enough at times, though he I tried to laugh them away. Oh well, atween that very rock aneath us and the coming tide, I saw or thought I saw, for the tale is so dreamlike that the whole might pass for a vision of the night, I saw the form of a man. His plaid was grey, his face was grey, and his hair, which hung down till it nearly came to the middle of his back, was as white as the white sea foam. He began to howk and dig under the bank, and could be near me, thought I. This mon be the unblessed spirit of old Adam Gowdgaupen, the miser, who is doomed to dig for shipwrecked treasure and count how many millions are hidden forever from man's enjoyment. The form found something which, in shape and hue, seemed a left-foot slipper of brass. So, down to the tide he marched, and placing it on the water, whirled it thrice round, and the infernal slipper dilated it every turn, till it became a bonny barge, with its sails bent, and on board leapt the form, and scudded swiftly away. He came to one of the haunted ships, and, striking it with his oar, a fair ship with mast and canvas and mariner started up. He touched the other haunted ship and produced the like transformation, and away the three spectre ships bounded, leaving a track of fire behind them on the billows which was long unextinguished. Now was nay that a bonny and fearful sight to see between the light of the hollow mass moon. But the tale is far from finished, for mariners say that once a year, on a certain night, if you stand on the barren point, you will see the infernal shallops coming snoring through the soulway. You will hear the same laugh and song and mirth and minstrelsy which our ancestors heard, see them bound over the sandbanks and sunken rocks like seagulls, cast their anchor in Blauhooli Bay, while the shadowy figure lowers down the boat and augments their numbers with the four unhappy mortals to whose memory a stone stands in the courtyard with a sinking ship and a shoreless sea cut upon it. Then the spectre ships vanish, and the drowning shriek of mortals and the rejoicing laugh of the fiends are heard, and the old hulls are left as a memorial that the old spiritual kingdom has not departed from the earth. But... I am on away and trim my little cottage fire and make it burn and blaze up bonny to warm the crickets and my cold and crazy bones that mon soon be laid beneath the green sod in the eerie kirkyard. And away the old dame tottered to her cottage, secured the door on the inside, and soon the hearth flame was seen to glimmer and gleam through the keyhole and window. I'll tell you what said the old mariner, in a subdued tone, and with a shrewd and suspicious glance of his eye after the old sibyl. It's a word that may not very well be uttered, 
But there are many mistakes made in evening stories if old Ma Moray there, where she lives, knows not mickle more than she is willing to tell of the haunted ships and their unhallowed mariners. She lives cannily and quietly. No one knows how she is fed or supported, but her dress is eye whole, her cottage ever smokes, and her table lacks neither of wine, white and red, nor fowl and fish, and white bread and brown. It was a dear scoff to Jock Matheson when he called old Moll the uncanny Carline of Blauhooli. His boat ran round and round in the centre of the Solway. Everybody said it was enchanted, and down it went head foremost, and had Nijok been a swimmer equal to a sheldrake, he would have fed the fish. But I'll warrant it sobered the lad's speech, and he never reckoned himself safe till he made old Maul the present of a new kirtle and a stone of cheese. Oh, father, said his granddaughter Barbara, you're surely wrong, poor old Mary Murray. What use could it be to an old woman like her, who has no wrongs to redress, no malice to work out against mankind, and nothing to seek of enjoyment save a canny hour in a quiet grave? What use could the fellowship of fiends and the communion of evil spirits be to her? I know Jenny Primrose puts Rowan Tree above the doorhead when she sees old Mary coming. I know the good wife of Kittlenacket wears Rowanberry leaves in the headband of her blue kirtle, and all for the sake of averting the unsonsy glance of Mary's right ear. And I know that the old laird of Burn Troutwater drives the seven cows to their pasture with a wand of witch tree to keep Mary from milking them. But what has all that to do with haunted shallops, visionary mariners, and bottomless boats? I have heard myself as pleasant a tale about the haunted ships and their unworldly crews as anyone would wish to hear in a winter evening. It was told me by young Benji Machark one summer night, sitting on our Byglen bank. The lad intended a sort of love meeting, but all that he could talk about was smear and sheep and shear and sheep and the wife which the Norway elves of the haunted ships made for his uncle Sandy Machark. And now I shall tell you the tale as the honest lad told it to me. Alexander Machark, besides being the laird of three acres of peat moss, two kale gardens, and the owner of seven good milk cows, a pair of horses, and six pet sheep, was the husband of one of the handsomest women in seven parishes. Many a lad sighed the day he was brided, and a Nithsdale laird and two Annandale moorland farmers drank themselves to their last linen, as well as their last shilling, through sorrow for her loss. But... Married was the dame, and home she was carried, to bear rule over her home and her husband, as an honest woman should. Now, you mon ken that though the flesh and blood lovers of Alexander's bonny wife all ceased to love and sue her after she became another's, there were certain admirers who did not consider their claim at all abated, or their hopes lessened by the Kirk's famous obstacle of matrimony. You have heard how the devout minister of Tinwald had a fair son carried away and bedded against his liking to an unchristened bride whom the elves and the fairies provided. You have heard how the bonny bride of the drunken laird of Selkitup was stolen by the fairies out of the back window of the bridal chamber the time the bridegroom was groping his way to the chamber door, and you have heard. But why need I multiply cases? Such things in the ancient days were as common as candlelight. So, you'll no hinder certain water elves and sea fairies, who sometimes keep festival and summer mirth in these old haunted hulks, from falling in love with the wheel-fared wife of Lord Matarg? And to their plots and contrivances they went, how they might accomplish to sunder man and wife. And sundering such a man and such a wife was like sundering the green leaf from the summer, or the fragrance from the flower. So it fell on a time that Laird Macharg took his half-net on his back, and his steel spear in his hand, and down to Blauhooli Bay gate he, and into the water he went, right between the two haunted hooks, and placing his net away to the coming of the tide. The night, Yamankin, was murk, and the wind lone, and the singing of the increasing waters among the shells and the pebbles was heard for sundry miles. All at once, lights began to glance and twinkle on board the two haunted ships from every hole and seam, and presently the sound as of a hatchet employed in square and timber echoed far and wide. But 
If the toil of these unearthly workmen amazed the laird, how much more was his amazement increased when a sharp, shrill voice called out, Ho, oh, brother, what are you doing now? A voice still shriller responded from the other haunted ship, I am making a wife to Sandy Macharg. And a loud, quavering laugh running from ship to ship and from bank to bank told the joy they expected from their labour. Now the laird, besides being a devout and a God-fearing man, was shrewd and bold, and in plot and contrivance and skill in conducting his designs was fairly an overmatch for any of a dozen land elves. But the water elves are far more subtle, and besides, their haunts and their dwellings being in the great deep, pursuit and detection is hopeless if they succeed in carrying their prey to the waves. But ye shall hear. Home flew the laird, collected his family round the hearth, spoke of the signs and sins of the times, and talked of mortification and prayer for averting calamity, and finally, taken his father's Bible, brass clasps, black print, and covered with fine calfskin from the shelf, he proceeded without let or stint to perform domestic worship. I should have told you that he bolted and locked the door, shut up all inlet to the house, threw salt into the fire, and proceeded in every way like a man skilful in guarding against the plots of fairies and fiends. His wife looked on all this with wonder, but she saw something in her husband's looks that hindered her from intruding either question or advice, and a wise woman was she. Near the mid-hour of the night, the rush of a horse's feet was heard, and the sound of a rider leaping from its back, and a heavy knock came to the door, accompanied by a voice saying, The cumber drinks hot, and the knave bairn is expected at Lord Lowry's tonight, so mount, good wife, and come. Preserve me, said the wife of Sandy Matark. That's news indeed. Who could have thought it? The laird has been airless for seventeen years. Now, Sandy, my man, fetch me my skirt and hood. But he laid his arm round his wife's neck and said, If all the lairds in Galloway go airless, over this door threshold shall ye not stir tonight. And I have said, and I have sworn it. Seek not to know why or wherefore, but, Lord, send us thy blessed moonlight. The wife looked for a moment in her husband's eyes and desisted from further entreaty. But... Let us send a civil message to the gossips, Sandy, and honey, you better say I'm sair laid with a sudden sickness, though it's sinful like to send the poor messenger a mile agate with a lie in his mouth without a glass of brandy. To such a messenger, and to those who sent him, no apology is needed, said the austere laird. So let him depart. And the clatter of a horse's hoofs was heard, and the muttered imprecations of its rider on the churlish treatment he had experienced. No, Sandy, my lad, said his wife, laying an arm particularly white and round about his neck as she spoke. Are you not a queer man and a stern? I have been your wedded wife now these three years, and besides my dower, I have brought you three as bonny bairns as ever smiled beneath a summer sun. Oh, man, you would do a man, and fitter to be an elder even than Willie Greer himself. I have the minister's ain word for it to put on these hard-hearted looks and gun wave in your arms that way, as if you said, I winna take the counsel of sick a hempy as you. I'm your ain leal wife, and will and mon have an explanation. To all this, Sandy Matarg replied, It is written, wives, obey your husbands. But we have been staying in our devotion, so let us pray. And down he knelt. His wife knelt also, for she was as devout as Bonnie, and beside them knelt their household, and all lights were extinguished. Now this beats ah, muttered his wife to herself. However, I shall be obedient for a time. But if I dinna ken what all this is for before the morn by circuit time, my tongue is nay longer a tongue, nor my hands worth wearing. The voice of her husband in prayer interrupted this mental soliloquy, and ardently did he beseech to be preserved from the wiles of the fiends and the snares of Satan, from witches, ghosts, goblins, elves, fairies, spunkies, and water-kelpies, 
from the spectre ship of Solway, from spirits visible and invisible, from the haunted ships and their unearthly tenants, from maritime spirits that plotted against godly men who fell in love with their wives. Nay, but his presence be near us, said his wife in a low tone of dismay. God, guide my good men's wits. I never heard such a prayer from human lips before. But Sandy, my man, Lord's sake, rise. What fearful light is this? Barn and byre and stable, Monby and ablaze, and Hawkey and Hurley, Doddy and Sherry and Dunson Plum will be smored in reek and scorched with flame. And a flood of light, but not so gross as a common fire, which ascended to heaven and filled all the court before the house, amply justified the good wife's suspicions. But... To the terrors of fire, Sandy was immovable as he was to the imaginary groans of the barren wife of Laird Lowry, and he held his wife and threatened the weight of his right hand, and it was a heavy one, to all who ventured abroad or even unbolted the door. The neighing and prancing of horses and the bellowing of cows augmented the horrors of the night, and to anyone who only heard the din, it seemed that the whole onstead was in a blaze and horses and cattle perishing in the flame. All wiles, common or extraordinary, were put in practice to entice or force the honest farmer and his wife to open the door. And when the like success attended every new stratagem, silence for a little while ensued, and a long, loud, and shrilling laugh wound up the dramatic efforts of the night. In the morning, when Laird Macharg went to the door, he found, standing against one of the pilasters, a piece of black ship oak, rudely fashioned into something like a human form, and which skillful people declared would have been clothed with seeming flesh and blood, and palmed upon him by elfin adroitness for his wife, had he admitted his visitants. A synod of wise men and women sat upon the woman of timber, and she was finally ordered to be devoured by fire, and that in the open air. A fire was soon made, and into it the elfin sculpture was tossed from the prongs of two pairs of pitchforks. The blaze that arose was awful to behold, and hissings, and burstings, and loud cracklings, and strange noises were heard in the midst of the flame. And when the whole sank into ashes, a drinking cup of some precious metal was found, and this cup, fashioned no doubt by elfin skill, but rendered harmless by the purification with fire, the sons and daughters of Sandy Machark and his wife drink out of to this very day. Bless all bold men, say I, and obedient wives. The best sentence in this story is way back at the beginning. Though I perceived in the communication of my friend something of the superstition of the sailor, I could not help thinking that common rumor had made a happy choice in singling out old Mark to maintain her intercourse with the invisible world. It's simultaneously piercing and oblique, this incredible way of leading up to a physical description of the man. As I mentioned, there's a kind of three-for-one with this story. There's the old woman's story about the ghostly ships, the man's story about the lost scoundrels, and then there's Barbara's story about the laird and his wife. It is kind of funny, by the way, that the fisherman, Andrew, literally drowns right in front of them, and it just sparks this long dialogue of gossip and storytelling. They don't notify his family or whatever a person does in that situation. They just shake their heads and curse the treacherous ships. There is so much to unpack in this story. As we know, I love a story that combines history and legend and folklore, and there's a lot here. Firstly, we have the knowledge that the ships are haunted, but they are somehow simultaneously haunted by ghosts of dead Danish mariners, and by evil spirits, and by water fairies, and there doesn't seem to be any meaningful distinction between those. There's also the idea that the ships are some kind of, like, temptation to evil. They light up and they glow and they sound like a party, which lures out those people who want to get drunk and be irresponsible, only for the ships to dissolve again and drown them in the bay. We have the bit about a magic brass slipper that turns into a beautiful boat. We have the bit about using the rowan tree to avert the evil eye. Frankly, the storytellers in this story are almost as interesting as the stories themselves. 
Of course, it's the final story that is the most fascinating, where the fairies kind of lay siege to a man in his house in order to steal his wife. It's interesting because I often read stories of fairy changeling children, but in this case they want to swap a changeling for an adult woman. Or not really a changeling, I guess, but an enchanted sculpture that would take her place. That's actually really creepy. I don't understand why the laird didn't just tell his wife what was going on, but instead he had to be angry and threatening the whole time. She seems like a good, smart woman, and she would have done the right thing. If you listen all the way to the end of the story, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is that this is one of the very first stories I actually recorded for the channel, although I have since deleted that recording. I think it's just a fantastic story, but I was intimidated by the accents and all the jargon and not sure how to approach a story with four different storytellers. I recorded it, but I didn't like the recording, so I sat on it for a long time trying to think how I could fix it. And you know how the prospect of fixing something is somehow just way worse than starting over? So eventually I deleted the recording and I decided to wait until this October to try it again. I do have a lot more comfort and confidence with the material now. Unfortunately, back then, I could do some little bit of a Scottish accent, which I just can't do now. As soon as I hit certain vowel sounds, everything flips to Irish. Boat. Butter. I also have a bad habit of going too quickly over the more accent-rich sections. It makes them easier for me to do, but I think it makes them even harder to understand than necessary. I had to really keep reminding myself to slow down during this recording, and I hope it succeeded particularly in the parts where our in-story narrators are quoting other people within their stories. Anyway, if you like old legends and bad accents, you should subscribe to the channel. Every week I seek out the best in old, odd, and interesting literature from around the world, and you wouldn't want to miss anything. Please also help other people find the channel by liking the video, dropping me a comment below, or maybe even sharing it with a friend. Thank you so much for the support, and I will see you in a few days.